Good morning. It's Outside the Classroom, and I'm meteorologist Ryan Miller. It is a beautiful sunny day once again. And for Outside the Classroom, we are here to help you out, to provide some educational resources that you can use at home and wear away from the classroom and away from school. This week, we've got a couple of things going. Number one, it's spelling week on Outside the Classroom. We are going to give you three words for the day today, ask you to spell them out, practice spelling them. Uh, parents, if you're watching, you can work with your children and make sure that these words can be spelled appropriately and correctly. And then tell you what, if you could actually show us a video, send us a video of you spelling these words out or perhaps writing them out on the sidewalk, those would all be wonderful things that you can do to interact with us. And let's get right to it. We've got some words to go over today. Today's three words are going to be used in the show. So I want you not only to write these down and remember them, I want you to listen for these words as we go over some of the activities today. Contour. Contour is one of, the, is one of our words. It's the first word. Suburban is the second word. Not the vehicle, but something else. And geographic. Geographic is our third word. Those are the words that we have for today. Please practice spelling them out. I'll tell you what, if you're watching us on Facebook, if you could actually uh, send us a quick picture of you practicing these words or a video, we're on Facebook Live. That would be a wonderful thing to do. Uh, let's just go over a couple of other things here to make sure we're all taking the activities that we're providing and doing them in an appropriate way. As a teacher, one of the things that I try my very best to do is to activate prior knowledge. We all come to the table when we're learning, uh, and we all come to the table bringing some type of experience or, or knowledge with us here when we come to, the, to try and learn new things. So it's about really bringing prior knowledge to the table. It's about learning something new and not completing tasks. And we really want to make sure that learning is active. The things we're doing can be done at home easily with just a few things around the house to help and make this endeavor work for all of us here. So keep these in mind as we're going through it all. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the things we're going to do today. It's beautiful out right now. The birds are chirping, actively chirping. Changes are all around, and we're going to continue to monitor change. We're actually anticipating some very heavy wind later today with a weather front that's going to be coming through. We have on our website, if you go to WJLA.com, full instructions on how to build your own anemometer at home. And when the wind starts blowing, you can take your anemometer and measure the speed of the wind. That is an idea for you to do at home today, if you're at least around the Washington, D.C. area. And you can also measure the direction of the wind. You can build a wind vane, and as long as you can locate north, you can build something that will tell you the direction that the wind is coming from. All of these assets are available. They're online at WJLA.com outside the classroom. And that is a great opportunity then for you to interact with us and share and show your weather data. Let's get right to how you can show your data. And we are blessed to have a resource online, a mapping resource. And if you go to ArcGIS.com, and ArcGIS.com, and if you search for ABC7, you can go down and find Outside the Classroom's map that has been made. And Outside the Classroom's map gives you the opportunity then to interact with us by taking weather data, taking measurements, and sharing and showing that data with us here on the show. That way we can keep tabs of how windy it's going to get later today. These dots on the map, these points that we're seeing, are data points that have been shared with us already. These are reports we're getting from folks, and it's so easy to put in a dot on the map. All you have to do, there's a little button, hit edit, and then you can just drop down your point wherever it is or wherever you live. And I'll tell you what, if you're watching us from a faraway location, perhaps you're on the west coast of uh, the United States, or perhaps you're somewhere else, you can also use this. It's free. It requires no accounts. ArcGIS.com and search for our Outside the Classroom map and then simply click on Edit. And please tell us what's happening wherever you are. 
You can put in the data, you can tell us the wind speed, everything is there. It's all built and easily activated by you to try and record and share data with us. So we're going to be measuring wind, we're going to be measuring wind speed, wind direction. We're going to be looking at how you can measure air temperatures and also how you can measure out the air pressure that we're detecting in the sky and the relationships between all of those. Let's get to uh, a couple of things for a moment. I wanted to show you a picture. I took this about 10 days ago, actually. It's a picture of a nest that we found in one of the trees near the home that I live in here. Let's take a look at this. We can see that there are some eggs in there. I didn't know what kind of bird laid these eggs or what kind of bird's nest it was, so I had asked folks that were watching the show to reach out to me, please, if you recognize or could tell me what would these uh, eggs be uh, uh, a bird fr or from, from what bird would the eggs be from, and we found out that they're cardinal eggs, and yesterday, from afar, I don't want you to think that I got close, these pictures are actually from afar, let's look at the other picture here, the eggs actually hatched and we have baby cardinals now in the tree that we have, the pine tree in our backyard. So we have gone from eggs to uh, baby cardinals very quickly in about 10 days. And we're going to keep tabs on the changes that are occurring back behind me in that pine tree as we can welcome some new baby cardinals to the world here. And we're in Virginia. The cardinal is the state bird of Virginia. Perhaps you could look up what the state bird is wherever you live and uh, let us know and share that with you here. So today we're going to be talking about literature, changes in literature. We've got a great exercise coming up from my dear friend Sarah Congable. We're going to be looking at changes in uh, our bodies and we uh, had the tooth fairy visit our house last night as one of the uh, baby teeth came out of our daughter Kennedy and we're going to be looking at how you can measure and graph out some of the data from the garden back behind me. All of that coming up in just a few minutes when Outside the Classroom returns. Hey everyone. One of the positives that's come out of this experience is that as a high school teacher, I'm now getting a chance to teach my 11 month old and my four and a half year old a lot, perhaps more than I wanted to. Um, but one of the ways that I find myself teaching my four and a half year old is to give him a chance to do a lot of reading, both on his own, flipping through and memorizing stories and making up stories on his own. And I'm reading to him and also in letting him read on his own with an iPad or a computer. There's lots of great websites that have availed themselves of this opportunity. And as I've been doing a lot of this reading with my child and thinking about everyone else who is encouraging their students and their children to learn through reading, um, I've been thinking a lot about change and characters. So many books from the youngest of the youngest to the oldest of the oldest have a main character that changes. And whether it's a book like this, where you learn that it's okay to make mistakes and that consequences can be good things to help us learn and grow, or a book like this, where the main character realizes that he has to just change his perspective and things look very different. Or a book like this, where we realize that everyone is motivated by different experiences and different needs and has different circumstances. A good way to get kids to think globally and broadly. Or our current favorite, thanks to Mo Wellens' Daily Doodle, where you learn it's just okay sometimes to have fun. Couldn't we all use a little more levity right now? For those of you that have upper elementary or middle school readers, you have the beautiful experience of young adult literature. Um, it's time to name this kind of book in which a character changes, has some sort of journey to learn more about him or herself. Um, it's called a buildings roman. You're welcome to Google that with your child and even look up the etymology, very fun. The nice thing about YA books is there's so many serials. So while one book can show you how a character can change um, to become more self-aware, three or four books later, you realize the character actually has some agency. And three or four books after that, the depth of the character has been developed such that he or she has become self-actualized. So these are really fun to trace change in characters over a whole series. 
And for high school, university, and adult readers who are reading literature of every kind, fiction and nonfiction, often follows the same Buildings Roman pattern. Really, it's all about a journey, isn't it? Almost every story is a journey of finding more about oneself. And the fun thing as you read more literary fiction, particularly, um, you sort of find that your relationship changes as the main character changes as well. So this is really fun fodder for discussion. As a character evolves and grows, how do you feel better about him or her? Or perhaps you look at him or her differently in a negative way too. So have fun reading. Take a moment to escape the current chaos in a good book and enjoy talking about change. Everyone, that was Sarah Con Gable, a colleague of mine in the Arlington Public Schools. Wonderful ideas here on how to accept and deal and uh, make changes, and you can look at all of those through literature. We hope you're doing okay at home here during these tough times for all of us, but hey, we are here as a resource to help you out, to give you some ideas of things that you can potentially do at home as we are all in this together. Now, here's a weather activity related to change. We've talked about on previous shows the idea of measuring certain variables related to the weather or the environment. Many of the devices that we have uh, and use in our daily lives, whether it's a phone or a personal device of some variety, they have built in barometers. A barometer is a tool that allows you the opportunity, and uh, you can tell we have kids here, folks, so I bet a lot of you can relate to this one here with the uh, cracks. Uh, but barometers built into these devices are a way for us to actually figure out how our height or what our height is, our altitude above sea level, our elevation. And so we use barometers as in these devices to determine how our elevation has changed, if we've gone up or down relative to sea level. So if you're at home and you have a device that has a built-in barometer, many of these portable devices do, then what you can do is get your barometers out. You can get a free app downloaded, and then you can start measuring the amount of air pressure that we have. Once you do that, if you go over to our website at wjla.com and you go to the outside the classroom webpage, well, we have a template that you can use. You can download a template, print it out at home if you have a printer. Uh, maybe if you could then, you could take uh, one of our templates. We have this template that you're looking at right now and you can start measuring out things like the air pressure. And then what we'd like you to do is to try and correlate the air pressure with the weather conditions that you observe when you make that uh, observation. So I've done mine for today, and right now it is uh, the 9th of April. We have an air pressure reading of 983. Uh, and if you look at some of the variables, we had some rain earlier. Now we're over at sunny conditions. You can change your units as well. There are many different units used to measure air pressure, uh, but you can go ahead and look at some of those, but we use this in meteorology here oftentimes. And so we have an example of how you can correlate and look for change in the air pressure and weather. Do this at home and please let us know what observations are you making. Speaking of folks at home, Corey and Manassas, thank you for checking in on Facebook. Corey's been watching us in Manassas, Virginia, and Corey told us on our Facebook Facebook page that the robin is the state bird of Michigan. So I now have Virginia as the cardinal, the robin in Michigan. If you're listening or watching anywhere else here, uh, whether you're in the DC area or uh, any part of the United States, please let us know what is the state bird wherever it is you live. And we also uh, were able to check in with a, a gentleman that's a fifth grade teacher, Danny Seagraves. Thank you for watching. Danny's a fifth grade teacher in the Fairfax County School System. And Danny, please share and showcase all the things that you could potentially add. We are always looking for ideas for things to do at home to encourage all of us to keep that learning process going when we are away from the classroom here. So those are some ideas of how you can measure things out in the weather. Let's talk about how you can observe change in the environment, and we're gonna do all of that when we return.
I'm Jeff, and this is Charlie, and today um, we're going to learn about waves. So Charlie's in fourth grade here in St. Louis at Holy Redeemer, and his class is learning about waves right now. So we thought it would be good to make a wave in a jar at home um, so we could practice doing some experiments on our own and learn about waves. So if you want to hold that up, Charlie, so everybody can see your wave in a jar. So to make a wave in a jar, you need a couple things. You need a jar or a plastic bottle that you can seal the lid tight and then you fill it halfway with water, which is the blue you see. So we added a few drops of blue food coloring so that you can see um, very clearly where the water is. And then you have to add oil on the top. So either um, vegetable oil or baby oil, but you wanna fill it almost to the very top of the jar. And then uh, cap the lid very tight, clean up, and then you're ready to go. So why don't we show them how it works, okay? So Charlie's gonna make a small wave to start. You can see if he tilts it back and forth, he's giving some energy to the jar, which is, that's how we're making waves, is with energy. And so the amplitude or the height of the wave is gonna be small, because it's a small, small amount of energy. So then Charlie, if you wanna do a more energy, so tilt the jar more, we'll get a bigger wave, meaning a higher amplitude wave. And then the other thing you can do is you can try to make a wave of different frequencies. So, if, Charlie, if you shake it a little faster, the wave will go back and forth faster. So there'll be more tr uh, crests or peaks of the wave in a shorter distance. And so that's like if you're at the beach and you count how many waves come in in a certain length of time, that's related to the frequency. So you can study all kinds of wave properties with a wave in a jar. Um, it's a fun little experiment to do at home. Jeff and Charlie in St. Louis, thank you so much for sharing and showcasing that video with us and looking at changes that you can observe in waves. And waves are a part of life in all facets, whether it's waves in energy or waves on the ocean. There are lots of ways and applications to waves. Thank you. Jeff and I went to college together. Jeff's wife, Kim, as well. We're all Penn Staters. And uh, thank you so much for contributing to the show here, Jeff and Charlie. So let's take a look at a few things here. We're outside, and it's outside the classroom. It's a beautiful day. We had rain earlier. I am fortunate enough to have a garden. And if you uh, live in an area where you have a garden as well, this is an activity that you can do at home. But if you live in an apartment, Perhaps you have some sunshine in a balcony or even a window that's facing the south so you can get some sunshine. Grab a little soil if you can here. Just uh, try to get a little bit of soil and maybe put it in a, a pot if you can or a dish or something. But uh, for me, one of the things that I like to do, and my daughter Kennedy was around a few moments ago. I was asking her to help. I don't know where she went, but I'll uh, go ahead and do this myself. So we planted, Kennedy and I planted the other day some carrots. And we have carrots in rows right through here in the garden. And we planted them last week, but one of the things that you could potentially do at home, an idea, and it doesn't have to be carrots, it can be uh, the grass and the lawn. So if you don't have access to a garden, um, you do have access on our website to a ruler. If you don't even have a ruler at home, if you go to the Outside the Classroom website, we have a ruler template. You can actually print this out if you have the ability to print. You can cut this ruler out and start measuring away if you'd like to. I'm just gonna simply use my ruler that I have right here right now and um, you can start measuring out the height of the plants as they grow. Now we're going to do that with the carrots. One of the things that you can do at home to make this an activity is that you can take some graph paper or take any type of paper, write the date down, and then if you wanted to make this a math activity as well, well then you can measure the height in inches and you can convert those to centimeters or vice versa or you can use the ruler to take measurements in both and then compare the numbers. But you could do this on a daily basis. It does not, again, have to be carrots. It could be the grass in your yard. If you wanted to find a spot where you could go and measure how high the grass is growing, right now, because of our cool nights and our warm days and our rain that we've been getting, it's a great time for plant growth, especially the grasses in the yard. So you can measure that out and then take it a step further. Once you have measured out and collected data, then you can go ahead, get some graph paper out, and start measuring the growth of that plant. 
You can measure time on the x-axis, the bottom axis here, plant height on the y-axis, and start graphing out the growth of whatever plant you choose to monitor and take data from. So we're going to do it with the carrots here, and we're going to keep tabs on that. If you wanted to scale this up a little bit, if you have someone at home that is uh, feeling a bit more adventurous from the educational side of things, well then you could actually try to look for and see, do you see changes in the rate, the speed that the plant is growing? And do you see changes in the weather impacting that speed of the plant's growth? Now, obviously, if it's colder out, you might see slower growth, and if it's warmer out, you might see more growth. But I'll tell you what, you can actually quantify that, you can measure that out, and then tell us, report back to us at home and say, hey, uh, uh, Mr. Miller, what is, uh, this is what our plants are, these are how our plants are growing when it's warm versus cold. So those are some ideas that you could do at home as we're away from the classroom. We've got templates for graph paper, we've got templates for rulers, we've got it all outside the classroom at WJLA.com. And please, on Chime In, which is also a part of that WJLA.com website, share and show us your videos and your pictures. We'll have more when we return. Welcome back again. It's Outside the Classroom, and I am meteorologist and science teacher Ryan Miller. We've been trying to focus on the idea of change, give you some ideas of things to do around the house to measure and look at change. One of the other items that we explored yesterday and to continue today on our website at Outside the Classroom, you can look at and measure temperatures and look at the differences between the urban and rural areas wherever it is you live. Thanks for watching. This is Outside the Classroom. We'll have a lot more activities for you. All the while, we're away from the classroom. Good morning, it's Outside the Classroom. I'm Ryan Miller. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us. It's a bright, sunny day where we are. We hope it's as bright and sunny wherever it is you are. We're looking at a couple of things this week. We have the theme of change across all of our shows this week, Change in Life. Change, speaking of change in life, uh, we're all dealing with a lot of that and a lot of changes in our lives and our daily schedules, but also changes in weather, changes in science, changes in math. However, we can observe and see and measure and find change in life. We're going to try and bring you some activities to look at and examine all of those things here on this week's episodes. We also have some spelling words of the day. If you are watching us and uh, want a little challenge here, we invite you. These are our words to spell out. Contour, suburban, geographic. These words we're trying to integrate into the show here throughout the day today and try to find where we can see contours or suburban or geographic as they apply to some of the activities we're doing. Spell these out. Share and show us your pictures of spelling them out or perhaps a video. Challenge your, uh, your friends or maybe your relatives. Can you spell suburban? Um, there we're not into embarrassing anyone because I am the first to admit I have terrible spelling. Uh, and if I'm put on the spot, I don't certainly uh, think I could spell really easily. So either way, please share and show any videos or photos you have spelling out the words of the day. Here's an activity. We talked about this idea of the urban heat island and the idea of the urban heat island being an effect that occurs when you look at the temperature readings inside of a city and the urban center versus locations outside of the city. So if you go to the WJLA.com website, search for Outside the Classroom, we have a template and an activity that you can do at home. If you print this out and uh, you take a look at it, you and your child, or if you're watching right now from anywhere, you can do this for any city, we have, this is the DC area. Here's the first activity that you can get out of this. This is a geographic one of the words of the day, a geographic lesson that you can do. This is the DC area. 
ask your child, where do you live? Where are you on this map? If you're in the DC area, of course, but you could do that for anywhere. What are some of the features on the map that you recognize? Do you recognize and know any of the shapes, the polygons that we have here? Very quickly, this is the District of Columbia, Arlington County. The areas that we have in gray on the map are the urban corridors within our region, the locations that have high density development. So if you're looking for an activity to do at home, you can go to this website, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the nowcoast.noaa.gov. I'll tweet that link out in just a little while as well, and I'll share with it and make sure it's on Facebook too. Nowcoast at NOAA, you can get the temperature readings for locations all around here. So one of the things that you could do at home is look at the data, focus in on the area you're trying to look at, and in our case it would be DC and the surrounding region, and then plot out the temperatures. Mark the temperatures. And then notice, do you see a warmer temperature in the area that's gray? Do you see changes then when you get away from the gray and move towards the areas that are not highly developed? Are they cooler? That's an idea. Now I did want to show and share case, showcase with you here the, uh, the website that we use. It's a government website through the folks at NOAA. Very easy to use actually with lots of information and data that you can uh, pull up at home and, and look at. It starts out in the United States, but if you zoom in on a location, and in our case here, it's DC in the DC area, we'll zoom in. And as we zoom in on the DC area, just like I showed you in that template, we are going to see and be able to pull up some readings. So I'm going to click on temperature, put that in there, and I will get the points, I hope. Something always works when you practice, and then the moment you stop practicing and go to use it, you end up, unfortunately, not having the data. Nevertheless, there will be points that will show up at some point when the data catches up here that would allow you to plot on a map, just like I showed you, all of the data that we have for temperatures or readings. And we're going to be talking about how you can model the weather through a station next week. Modeling, not necessarily on a catwalk, but modeling is going to be our theme for next week. And we're going to look at some models and look at temperatures and all the things that we have in the weather to look at and involve that involve our environment. When we return, we've got a really cool video from the International Spy Museum, Changes in Disguises. All of that coming up in just a few moments. Hi everyone, it's Jackie Isle from the International Spy Museum with you again this week uh, for our week of change and transformation. And, you know, I think it would be a remiss of me not to talk about disguise when it comes to change and transformation in the world of spying. So as you can see, I changed my look up a little bit. I just stuck on a baseball hat, stuck on my sunglasses, but it's really easy for me to just do what we call a quick change by taking those items off and going back to my regular look. And that is something that spies call a quick change. Now, for spies, disguise is really important and it could be a matter of life and death for them when they're operating overseas. It's important for them to conceal their identity, come up with a fake name, uh, even have fake passports and identifications, but also to change their look. And the reason is, is that keeps them safe when they're operating undercover in a foreign country so that people don't know who they are and they don't what's called blow their cover um, or expose their real identity. So disguise really can come in handy. Disguise is not like a Halloween costume. So like for instance, <clears throat> if I just like say put this on, yikes, you know, this would not be a great disguise, right? Because you don't really see people walking around with like Viking helmets or whatever this helmet is. Um, so I would not choose that for my disguise, but I'm gonna challenge you to go around your house, find um, as many, you know, hats, 
you can find um, glasses, sunglasses, regular glasses, um, and to build your own disguise kit. Uh, we do have a sheet here available for download on our website called Disguise for Cover. And it's gonna have all kinds of recommendations for how you can build your disguise kit. It also has a mustache template for you, so you can use that. And you can also make a fake passport with your new cover details and a photograph of yourself in disguise. So that can help you with your disguise kit. And then you can also play a game that I like to call the quick change disguise game. You make a set of cards, <clears throat> one with occupations, um, vet, rock star, baker, or just some that I came up with, but you can come up with a whole bunch. And countries of origin, Japan, Germany, um, you can even do cities like Washington DC, whatever you feel like. And then someone can deal a card. You could be a vet from Japan, right? And then you have a certain amount of time to get into that disguise that matches this cover identity. You can even then fill out your passport with that cover identity. So I challenge you to go undercover, get in disguise, and send us your photos of yourself in disguise. Good luck recruits, have fun with this one. Jackie and our friends at the International Spy Museum, thank you for contributing that. Disguises, a great way to change uh, and look at change very quickly here. So if you have a disguise you want to put yourself into, please take a picture of you before you have your disguise on and then after and share it with us on Facebook at WJLA.com's uh, streaming on Facebook here. You can also send us anything on our website, WJLA.com. Chime in, a great way to share us any video or any type of uh, uh, pictures that you're taking here. Let's get back to and finish up and wrap up one of the other things that we've been doing, and that's monitoring change in the environment. So we can change the way we look, we can look at change in literature. We have this website here. This is the Now Coast website on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Websites uh, Administration's website. I've got the weather stations for locations around the DC area. And I went and I used two different colors. And I used two different colors to write down the temperatures. The temperatures inside the gray area are the temperatures that we have in the urban areas. And the temperatures that are in blue are the temperatures in the rural or suburban parts of the D.C. area. So you have these differences in temperature and you can look for changes. If you do see any changes, this is a template with the website on it and there are some directions on how to do this. And it's easy to find this on WJLA.com's Outside the Classroom website. So here's another idea for you to take a look at and monitor data from the convenience of your home. If you have a printer, fantastic, you can print this out or you can even uh, perhaps just plot them out on your computers. So here's another idea looking at the idea of colors and changes in colors right now. Hello outside the classroom friends. I'm Amy Goodman, a lifestyle expert, and I have just noticed that spring is so gorgeous right now with all of her beautiful colors. The plants are coming out, the flowers are blooming, and there's a lot to celebrate just outside our doorstep. And it got me to thinking a bit about colors, where they come from, and specifically how we use them as dyes and things like natural cloths like this tie-dye done on silk, or tie-dye, and this is my Japanese tie-dye, that was done with indigo. Where do colors come from? How do we use them? So a lot of indigenous people, which means people of, from a na that are native to a land, used a lot of natural elements to bring about colors in their cloths, or to decorate, or to use for special rituals. So let's guess what colors the natural elements in front of me will produce. So first up, what do you think about this? These are onions. So these onions actually make a really pretty yellow color. If you got red skinned onions, it would make more like a reddish purplish color. How about these guys? Avocados. Avocados actually, believe it or not, make a pink color that would include both the skin and also the seed inside if you use it. A pink color. Along with that pink color family, you can well imagine that things like berries can make things red or pink. 
Blueberries will make things blue. That might be a bit obvious, but what about tea? Tea and coffee make things brown. So that might not be my first choice for a color for dyeing, but often used in many things. Don't forget about spices. So here I have saffron, and this is saffron which is dried up. This actually makes a really, really vibrant yellow color. And anybody who cooks knows that if you drop saffron on the kitchen counter, it can really stain your kitchen counter. A bright yellow color. Another spice that makes a, like a yellow orangish hue is turmeric. Here, I'm gonna get it for you here. So even the dried spices that you have to the fruits and veggie in your refrigerator are used as natural dyes to make things have color. Now, for those of you who are looking forward to Easter or just like to dye things, this is from your regular kit that you can get at the store where you get a color packet, little pelt there, and you add it to a bowl and so often you're like, yes, 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 I want to make something orange. But then when you add the vinegar, it turns another color. You know what I mean? So here I've chosen a color. It looks like it's going to be yellow. So we're going to add just a tablespoon of vinegar really quickly. This causes a chemical reaction with the color pellet in order to make the color, the dye, come out. So when I add that, it is not yellow at all. It's actually a really pretty green color. We're going to let this dissolve and then I'm going to show you a fun trick. So you know how oil and water do not mix? We're actually going to add to this one tablespoon of vinegar a tablespoon of oil. Why would we do that? In addition to the half a cup of water that is required, what's going to happen when we dye our boiled egg? Because oil and water do not mix, you're going to end up with a really cool egg. Wherever the oil sticks to the white part of the egg, it will remain white. And where the shell has no oil on it, the color will adhere. So what you end up with are some really cute, marbleized or tie-dyed eggs. That's all I have time for today. It was so fun spending this wonderful moment with you outside the classroom. Until next time, take care and be well. of Fabulous in the Kitchen. Today I want to talk to you about doing a little in-home gardening project. Now don't worry, you don't have to go outside and get in any dirt or cause any big mess in the kitchen. We are simply going to take some scallions and regrow them on the countertop. And if you have um, siblings, this could be a really fun competition. So take your scallions and perhaps your parents or even if you're cooking, when you use them in a recipe, you just want to reserve the bottom part, okay? And you can simply place the bottom in a cup like this. Add a little bit of water in each of them. Just want to cover that root really good. And then just sit them on the kitchen countertop. They don't have to be in the sun, but if you sit them in the sun, great. And your scallions will regrow in a matter of days. Look at these that I've regrown on my countertop already. Now the way you can make it competitive is to see whose scallions grow the longest. So take a measuring stick every couple of days and see how far your scallions have grown. I hope you have fun with this great project and enjoy. 
That's a cool idea for you if you wanted to do some regrowth here and look at change uh, from some scraps from some certain vegetables. Please uh, take a look at that and try it at home. Send us some pictures. Here is another idea that you can do around your apartment building or uh, wherever it is you live. I call this the old scent diary. In the springtime, talking about change, we have lots of changes and lots of really nice scents. As many of the plants that are around us grow and start flowering, one of my very favorite scents comes from this plant that I planted a few years ago. This is a lilac and Mm, it has such a great smell and there are lots of really cool smells all around wherever you are uh, whether you're in the DC area or beyond so here's my idea for you that you can look for change in smell change in the appearance of plants we came up with in my house a scent scale and I wrote the scent scale here in sidewalk chalk you could do any type of scale with your kids at home uh, we have a one through four scale here one meaning yuck don't like the smell uh, two is okay three is a good smell not great but good and four is awesome so develop your own scale and use your own words or suggest some words or have your kids try to come up with some words to describe your scent scale and then start looking around or more importantly start smelling around wherever you live and come up with a map of where you have really good scents coming and actually things that may not smell at all or don't smell good at all to you so that's an idea that you can create your scent scale your scent diary if you wanted to take this a step further you could take pictures of the plants that you have around you you could try to identify the plants that are around you the common name the scientific name but those are ways to scale up or scale down your activity but it does take advantage of the fact that it's springtime and there are so many really cool plants that are coming out right now and flowering and even better smells that are coming from lots of these plants. So think about creating a scent scale and doing a scent diary here and uh, send and share and showcase all of the things that you're doing at home with us um, as we get through this time away from the classroom. This is Outside the Classroom. I'm meteorologist and science teacher Ryan Miller on this beautiful morning across our region. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in a couple minutes. It's outside the classroom and change week at that inside and blah, blah, easy for me to say outside the classroom. We had some changes in the Miller household here overnight. My daughter Kennedy lost a tooth and so we're seeing changes uh, showing up in our uh, lack of dental or I should say dental uh, uh, or appearances here and everything else. So changes are occurring all around us. We have been looking at the idea of smelling flowers do you smell any, anything coming from those flowers? No. No? Really? Can you smell that one and let me know if you smell anything? No, no nothing there. Yeah, anything over there? Those smell okay? Kind of. Kind of? Oh, great. Thanks for picking that. Um, we're looking for scents, and I'll tell you what, there are a lot of beautiful things out at this time of year that may not have a scent. That is something that you can potentially look for as we have changes occurring all around us. We have our scent scale that we came up with, where one would mean yuck, two is okay, three is good, and four is awesome. What would you rate this as? What would the smell be? Would there be a one, two, three, or four? Four? All right, we got a four. How about this one over here? What would you rate this flower? A one. A one? A yuck? Or maybe no? A yuck. All right, there's some there. Let's keep looking for some scents. It doesn't have to be a flower, folks. We have lots of plants that are growing. Let's try this one out here. What would you rate this? If you crush this up, it's rosemary here. If you crush that up, what's that smell? Rate that one. Three and a half, three and a half, folks, 3.5. Nothing but precision here uh, in outside the classroom. We've got another one here that you could possibly smell. What do you think this one is? This is thyme. I'm gonna crush it up to get the oils activated there and the smell. That would be a, all right. We're gonna keep looking at scents and smells here. Please let us know how we're doing outside the classroom at wjla.com. Thank you for watching. We hope to see you again soon.